okay, so technology and, and markets can provide for our desires and satisfy our desires extremely well, but they cannot tell us what to desire. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast, a project dedicated to exploring the world of anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas. Join us in our conversations with radical voices in precarious times. To view our full catalog, visit our website at nonserviummedia.com. If you'd like to support the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to help spread the word, and so you can stay updated with our most recent episodes. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast. I'm your host, Joel Williamson, and you are listening to the 27th episode of the show. For the third installment of 2021, I'll be speaking with someone to whom non servian media owes a great deal of gratitude. If you've been following us from the beginning, you're probably familiar with our original video series titled Anarchy in Oklahoma. However, you may not know that we shot every single one of those interviews over the course of two years at a conference called Exploring Anarchism. Our guest today is the person who organized these events, and nearly 100 videos later, we finally have the honor of interviewing him. Today's guest is not only an interesting political thinker, he's also a good friend of mine. Here's my interview with Cooper Williams. Old Coop was probably the best neighbor I've ever had. Like I said, he's a good friend and a good person. He's an intellectual with many skills and talents worthy of admiration. He's a machine learning engineer, working in natural language processing and recommender systems. Cooper Williams, welcome to the show. Hey, glad to be here. Awesome. How the hell are you, Coop? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. Like I said, not having the most productive day, but it's a beautiful day to go on a walk with your wife, which I just did. So I'm good. <laughs> Amazing. I miss both you and Lena. You were just a walk down the block not that long ago when we both lived in Austin. I miss those days. Me too, me too. Uh, when you apply for jobs, do you use the name Ol Coop or do you use your Christian name? Well, I have to say I use my Christian name. Old Coop is my code name for um, when I'm doing <laughs> stuff off the radar. So, so you can build me as Old Coop <laughs> if you want. <laughs> Um, we'll edit that out. Sure. Did you know that you can't spell cooperation without Cooper? Yeah, I did know that actually. Um, I got in trouble as a kid for vandalizing, uh, signs by underlining coop in the word. Really? Yeah. Cause my, when I was a kid, I would like go to daycare uh, in a gymnastics facility and I would like do that. And the owner got on me. Badass man. All right, old coop. Let's go ahead and just just dive into this thing, I suppose. Um, yeah. So you got a pretty good job not that long ago uh, related to machine learning, engineering, uh, natural language processing, and recommender systems. What the hell is all that? Gotcha. So those are three different things. So basically, the two later things are different types of machine learning. So what I do is I basically use a new paradigm of computer programming called machine learning. It's not even new. None of it's really new. It's just recently computers have become powerful enough to use these probabilistic methods of solving problems. So neural networks, right, is like the new thing in connection to AI. That's only become like really commercially viable in the last 10 years, largely due to like the rise of people buying video cards, which can like really speed up those operations. Um, but we've we've known that neural networks were possible since like the 50s. Uh, which is kind of the mind-blowing thing. Like the AI that we use is like, you know, theorized and built like in the 50s, in like the 80s and 90s. So anyway, what I do is basically I use, so natural language processing is a type of machine learning that is all about processing text, which is different from computer vision because like text is like a sequence. Whereas computer vision is dealing with an image, which it has like a, you know, a generally like a fixed size. 
And then what was the third thing? Recommender systems. That's like any like service that recommends products or recommends like some kind of experience. So like an Amazon or like what video you should watch next on YouTube, what you see in your Facebook and Twitter feed, those things are all decided by recommender systems. Okay. Um, what's that tech magazine? Wired. So I was looking at some Wired Facebook comments once. And the concerns that some readers were having was that they were becoming too political for their taste. They're saying, I uh, read this magazine for the technology, not the politics. But to me, that strikes me as incredibly short-sighted because these two things at this point are basically, (laughs) they overlap so much that you can't, the political implications can't be undone (laughs) and kind of have to be discussed, right? So yeah. how, does, how does this technology overlap with your politics? Yeah, so it's worth noting that the guy who founded Wired like, is a very political and philosophical person. You, know, you couldn't say that it didn't have a political provenance when the founder believes that you know, technology is a living entity. Like a, mm-hmm. It's like a distributed intelligence that uses humans to build itself. <laughs> so like mm-hmm. with that I don't know with that said I I agree with you as well that you can't divorce well you can talk about tech without talking about politics but that I don't think that's ever the kind of magazine that Wired was if you mm-hmm. want that kind of thing you can read like IEEE Spectrum or whatever like Linux site I don't know there there's plenty of plenty of outlets for that kind of thing um and Wired is like a culture magazine at the end of the day um what was your original question though <laughs> So my original question is, how does your profession or the things that you're interested in as far as like machine learning, engineering, natural language processing and recommender systems, how does that how does that overlap with your personal politics? Yeah. Okay. well, so I first got interested in AI um, a few years ago when I just like read this article. Actually, it was a long form blog post with like multiple installments um, on wait, but why? And just talked about AI safety and the possibility that AI that AI could become an artificial general intelligence, which quickly becomes a super intelligence and that that poses an existential risk to humans. And since then, like my interest has gone more from AI safety to just sort of like more short-term considerations about the effects that the machine learning systems have on society. And, and also just more broadly, like I'm interested in um, how social media is, is changing um, how people relate. So yeah, I guess, where it comes to my work, there's not too much moral weight uh, assigned to it because just the nature of the projects that I'm on aren't terribly political. I can sleep at night uh, knowing that I've done the, my, the best that I can and that uh, you know I've just contributed to economic growth. When it comes to my work, pretty much what I'm doing is I'm automating tasks that would otherwise be done by a human who finds it extremely boring. Um, <laughs> like literally just looking at documents and like saying whether they're correct or not. And that kind of thing is like, you know, you can't really do it very easily with traditional programming methods, but it's also super boring for a a human to do. So I I feel pretty good about like automating that kind of thing. (laughs) Okay. So you and I have had conversations about what artificial intelligence is and all of its implications. And, you know, I feel like it's worth just talking about what it actually is. Like, what is artificial intelligence? Yeah. So that's a good question. And it's kind of, it's still an open research question is kind of the short story because, because we still don't, there's a lot about intelligence. We still don't understand. It's not well-defined and experts in the field still argue about whether there is such a thing as artificial general intelligence. That is like, is there actually any mind that just generally is intelligent or are we actually just looking at a bunch of narrow intelligences that do one or a few things really well? Like we like to think that humans can do a bunch of things really well, but human intelligence isn't that well understood. I would argue that what makes human intelligence really special is that we're able to situate ourselves into a context that is historical um, and embodied. And we can, we have a memory and we can, we can sort of play language games that are within a certain historical context, which machines can't do. Now, the hope for art, for AI is that, you know, we can take 
a machine that is that has like broken the world down into zeros and ones that is like quantized this world that's really complex and simplified it into bits and yet go from that foundation to something like what we have or better the hope is that uh, we can have a system that um, has all the generality of human intelligence and more but essentially can can predict things better. Um, it can form its own experiments and like sort of explore the world in a new way. Um, maybe you can experience like joy or um, love, perhaps. I don't know. There's all kinds of dreams you can come up with. But uh, I guess the short answer to your question at the end of the day is that we don't have it. We don't know what AI is. And the people who actually build these systems um, talk about it. They're, they will say deep learning or machine learning or some more technical term. And if you hear AI, it's probably a journalist or a marketer. At least we've been referring to we've been referring to present things. <laughs> Got it. It's a mishmash. Yeah. Uh huh. So um, let's say one day we were actually able to develop deep learning or uh, artificial intelligence or whatever. What do you think the like best and worst case scenario is politically? Mm, you mean uh, you mean if we developed a an, an artificial general intelligence like a machine that can uh, that can that is generally good at things? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> what are the best and worst case scenarios? I mean, to me, I think all of the most likely scenarios are neither utopia nor dystopia. They're just kind of weird topia. <laughs> So there's a lot of contingencies. And the, the biggest one is, would an artificial general intelligence be an AGI? Um, would an AGI be aligned with human um, interests enough that, like, that it would let us survive in a way that we generally like? Um, the second biggest question is, how quickly is its intelligence going to grow? So that's called the, uh, that thing is called the hard takeoff question or the FOOM question. And there have been a bunch of, you know, whether does it go foom, right? Does it go from human level intelligence and then connect to the internet and then just like learn a ton of stuff and just go crazy with power? So th there's a lot of question about that. I actually used to think, I was, I was used to be convinced that um, an AGI would sort of do that and it would just bootstrap. Well, that is like, it would pull itself up by its own bootstraps. It would connect to the internet and just become, you know, a god. <laughs> And it would learn to learn and learn to become more intelligent really quickly. I'm less convinced of that nowadays because I guess thinking about intelligence, it seems like it's not, it's, it's not one, um, it's not some mysterious quantity that it's not really like a ladder that exists that you just need enough strength to pull yourself up. It's a series of, a series of historical developments you know, it's it's like stages of human development. They're all very different. And you can't be a better adult by just growing in the same way that a child grows. At least I think you can. Maybe you can. <laughs> but, but, you know, like, I don't think that it's, it's, I don't think we know enough. So if we had a world where we have an AGI, say you wake up one day and you have no memory of who you are, but there are voices telling you that um, you were, you're, a computer program, right? What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in that world, we have no idea what would happen. Robin Hansen is this like physicist economist who has tried to sort of imagine, like he's written this whole book called The Age of M, which kind of imagines the economy, an economy of digital workers who are human level intelligence, but they, they don't tire out because they don't have bodies. And you get like this weird topia where humans just don't work really, um, or their work is like so useless, so like worthless that they don't work. And the M's just sort of like run the world and humans become kind of a backwater. <laughs> and on the contrary, like if artificial intelligence does go foom and become a super intelligent godlike being, then the first question becomes a lot more relevant. Does it care about humans? And I also used to think that it was more likely that AGI would be like a, you know, like a really smart spider and it wouldn't be very, wouldn't like care about humans and would treat them as ants essentially. Now, I think that intelligence is attracted to certain paths of thought, so to speak, and that it would probably learn, it would learn about morality along the way, like instrumentally. It would be useful for it to understand game theory and morality and meaning 
in some sense. So that's not to say we shouldn't be afraid of AGI and like try to like research how to make it safe. But I think that like, it's possible that you could get a benevolent God out of it. <laughs> wow. What do machine learning and philosophy of the self have to do with one another? Ooh, that's a great question. So this is a big conversation that I'm not super well read on, but I know that like, well, like since Descartes, people have been talking about <clears throat> what is the relationship of thinking to the self. And Kant talks about something called the unity of apperception, where you have all of these perceptions and understandings of the world that are sort of united in a person. And that's what we call a self. I think that I think that's the basic idea. And we but we take for granted, I guess, that <clears throat> that the human subject is a single self that it's, it's one, it's one me, it's one I, if I was to say like, you know, you are part of me and that actually both of our bodies are me, then it would be kind of meaningless, right? It would be really hard to imagine that actually <clears throat> like you and I are both parts of the same thing, which is Cooper. I don't have any access to your internal experience. So that part of the system that is you is cut off from me. But also in a, in a modern sense, like from a modern perspective, it's really easy to think of extensions of ourself in, ourselves in the world. So people have always talked about leaving a legacy. That's part of an extension of yourself. Also property can be thought of, private property, it can be thought of as like an extension of one's will in the world. So if you, you know, like in a sense, we're living in Rockefeller's world. Um, <laughs> this This one man who had this, bloodthirsty, you know, desire for gaining money. And every, every red cent he made was more victory. And he shaped the world that we live in and made it into this, you know, oil economy. So in a sense, Rockefeller lives on everywhere. <laughs> anyway, like the whole point of this is to say that um, the self is a really nebulous thing, I think. And it's more nebulous than we give it credit for. It's possible that some people are multiple selves in like a really true sense. Like there are, there are multiple agents. Yeah. So I, I think philosophically that when you start asking, why does it matter? I think philosophically it, it matters from a practical moral perspective to consider whether yourself is actually multiple, multiple agents who sort of have, can be viewed as having different interests. I don't understand what you mean by that. How can we, ha how can you have multiple agents within one agent? Yeah, there's a really interesting essay series by a guy named Kaj. Oh, what's his last name? It's K-A-J is his first name. And he writes about um, the internal family systems theory, um, which is something he's like built on from other people's ideas. But the basic idea is that you have, most people have like agents in their brain, in, in their mind that sort of regulate the flow of thoughts into your conscious uh, your consciousness. So there's part of your your mind that is kind of like a workspace where it, it holds the, thing, the things you're currently working with. And it can't hold that many things. Like if you try to keep 10 numbers in your head, you're going to have a really hard time unless you start like saying it out loud and like using different parts of your brain to remember those numbers. And yet your brain contains all of this stuff that is like, you know, you don't think about. I, I haven't had uh, psychedelic experiences, believe it or not, but there are people, I've read a lot about it. Um, and people who have psychedelic experiences talk about how it seems to be opening up like a part of their brain that they, a part of their mind, I should say, because your mind is not your brain. Um, but it's opening up a part of your mind that had lain dormant or memories that they had forgotten. It's exposing them to, th them to things that they had been avoiding thinking about. So that's kind of what I'm talking about. You're mind is a very complex thing and it has an interest in keeping you from thinking about certain things. And so that's, that's what I mean. There are multiple objectives being served. Got it. That's, uh, that's wild. I just had a conversation with Alex from C4SS and we were talking about his perspective on spirituality and we got into like Jewish mysticism and different aspects of Kabbalah and stuff, mm -hmm. which I've been you know, I was interested in that when we lived in uh, next to one another in uh, Austin. But yeah, yeah. Um, but a lot of these, a lot of these findings are are just so damn similar to what 
really old religious traditions have seemed to imply. Is that just coincidence or Mm -hmm. have um, we sort of been trying to make sense of this sort of thing for a long time using different types of language, you know? Yeah. No, yeah, I think I think it absolutely it absolutely is the case that old religions are cluing into this kind of thing and giving us sort of a handle on phenomena that we don't understand. Putting a name to something can give you some kind of power over it. Although it also can make you make you more susceptible to its power depending on what it is. Mm-hmm. You know, we have we have all kinds of names like you know, modern Modern social justice is all about changing language um, because we recognize that language has power over us. It, it has power over, over our relationship to each other and to the world. And I think I think that's you know that's absolutely true. And what religion is is a sort of a uh, a meta language for you know it. Well, I'm sort of trying to come up with some highfalutin description of this. It's just a way to talk about the world um, within a system that makes sense, right? It lets you make a perception of the world that is consistent and also consistent, you know, with what other people think. So if you buy into Christianity, for example, like a like a Protestant, non-denominational, Bible-believing Christianity, then you're buying into a, a system of language that lets you describe like let, lets you describe unknowing, hard things that happen in life for seemingly no reason, lets you talk about death, lets you talk about guilt and like the internal conflicts, kind of like you know internal agents like I was just talking about. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there is this quote by Baudrillard that I can't remember off the top of my head. But it was something along the lines of, as soon as you utter the words, I love you, to your partner, you have already committed infidelity and <laughs> and then have fallen in love, not with your partner, but with words. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've been thinking about that recently. Yeah. That's, a, that's a very, uh, an extremely monogamous view, I think. <laughs> Can't you have a menage a trois with language? <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's right. I think I do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. So I do want to, to come back around to, to religion a little bit because that's one of the topics that you recommended we discuss. But let's, um, I, I ended up writing a lot more tech questions than I had imagined. I actually crowdsourced a lot of this from um, hmm. mutual friends of ours. All right. But um, the next thing I wanted to ask you was, how will the future development of machine learning impact international power balances? Mm. That's a really that's a really interesting question. I have to say that like I'm not like super well versed in geopolitics. At least I'm not a geopolitics nerd. But I do think that I do think that the the course of geopolitical history is largely determined by the cultures of the you know, people inside of those countries, not just what their leaders do, but also, you know, how, you know, mainly how the populace acts and how they, how different countries see themselves in relation to other countries. So there's a lot of fear about China right now. I think that's sort of like the core of the question is um, that the U S is obviously spending a lot of money on AI research um, and it is the the tech center of the world, like all but maybe three of the top like tech companies, like the tech unicorns are in the U.S. And meanwhile, China is building this techno bureaucratic panopticon that exists behind the Great Firewall. And they are also investing in AI. And so the question is, like, what will what will the leaders of those company, countries do? I think what people don't pay enough attention to is the value of data. I mean, people just don't actually understand the value of data at all. And I don't, I mean, this is not a condemnation. I just think that it's not very well talked about in the media. So for example, like people often say that they don't care like who has their data. And like they imagine, I think some company getting a hold of their email address and their phone number. It's like, okay, who cares? I'll like block you, spam you, whatever. I'll put you in the spam inbox. But on a high scale level, in the aggregate, you can learn a whole lot about human beings um, by collecting data on them. And this is why we do experiments in a laboratory. Um, But experimentation on human subjects in Western countries is heavily regulated. 
And so it's a lot easier to sort of collect lots of data from different sources. And if you can link it all together, like if you can say this person bought this, you know, this Airbnb location and bought this product and watch this show, and you can build it all into like one large, long, you know, tapestry of a person's life. And then you can do that for like, you know, millions or billions of people. Then you can learn a lot about how humans act and respond to different stimuli. All of this is to say that what China is doing, I'm convinced, is um, trying to crack human nature and essentially, you know, build China into what its national myth has always wanted it to be. Um, China has a, a, an incredibly long history. Um, I think thousands of years of like calling itself China, essentially, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, it, it's it's the oldest, I think the oldest country in the world by some, in some sense, unless you bring in Middle Eastern countries. Anyway, super old country. It has this, this long tradition of rulers trying to unite um, the smaller provinces, the smaller kingdoms into one larger thing. And their systems of governance are all about subduing the individual to um, assimilate into the community and to become a functioning part of the community. I think that I wouldn't fearmonger too much about China in the long run because I don't think that their economic metrics that they're releasing, their economic growth is like anywhere near what they say it is. I don't think it's really that sustainable. Um, their quasi fascist capitalist system. But what they can do in the short run is sort of maneuver people using big data. I think that is actually possible um, to manipulate people's lives on a micro level and sort of change history or try to change history, you know, in a very fast paced way. So with that said, I think, I don't know, I think that China's reach shouldn't be underestimated and the effects that it's having in the third world um, need to be you know, paid more attention to as they're investing so much in the third world and they're exfiltrating tons of data from the US and from the West in general. So that's, I guess that is what I would point to and just vaguely gesture at. I don't, I can't tell the future though. That sort of begs the question then a, a problem of technological progress existing alongside states, right? How do we address the concern that technological progress could be captured by the state and used for nefarious purposes instead of mm -hmm. instead of growing our autonomy and, and empowering individuals. Yeah, I mean, I think that the the case is that it's always kind of been that way. This like against the grain has a lot to say about this kind of thing because at if you are like a peasant living in upland China, not even a peasant, sorry, if you are a farmer living in upland China trying to avoid being taxed, then you can farm vegetables that are like scattered around the region and stay nomadic and not be pinned down and not be made legible to a tax a taxing system. But if you if you begin to farm wheat and you stay in the same place, then you can be taxed because you're you're there and you're accountable. People, someone can write you down on a piece of parchment and say, you know, how big your land is and how much you need to be taxed every year. And technology enables this kind of thing by its very nature. I'm not even sure I would say that tech is neutral. I feel like that kind of, it kind of dodges the question. And it's what a lot of people say. I think the truth is, is different. It's that some tech, some tech is symmetrical. That is, it can be used like by power or against power. And some tech is asymmetrical, meaning that it is inherently decentralizing um, and inherently descaling the system to the individual level. So I have a lot of, you know, I really strongly believe in decentralizing tech, although that's not my technical expertise, like decentralized finance and decentralized social, I hope are the future. And essentially those systems are our only hope at preserving some control over our computing experience, right? Over our use of computers. But also, if people migrate to those decentralized systems in mass, then control over internet infrastructure, right, becomes even more important. Um, this is why some people are building mesh networks in certain cities, um, like they're essentially constructing their own internet so that they don't have to rely on Spectrum or AT&T or whoever to provide their infrastructure. And 
I think the general rule then is that if you want more freedom, if you want more free technology, you have to be smarter and you have to accept crappier results because like you're, you know, you're going to have to build a lot of it yourself or use someone else's build. Oh, but I, I should say too, while I'm on this ramble that open source software is, is still underappreciated. What does open source mean to you, Joel? I'm, I'm curious when you think of that, that phrase. Open source software to me, when I think of that phrase, I suppose having knowledge publicly available as to like how that software functions. That's the main thing, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. But did you know that like most of the internet like runs on open source software? It's not stuff that is closed and secret and you can't understand how it works. Mm -hmm. um, like Linux, hardly anyone uses for their personal computing, their, their personal computing, but like Linux is this open source free software that drives like most enterprise systems, like most companies like are using Linux on like most of their machines behind the scenes. And so much of what companies build proprietarily is on the backs of open source software that people just made like as a hobby mm -hmm. or out of, out of passion or, mm -hmm. or to solve a problem that they have. So that's, I guess, the really, the thing that can't be underestimated is that people value open source software and that's not going to change. Right. So that, that sort of makes me think of what it means to build a useful alternative because in radical spaces, anarchist spaces, etc., there's often talk of using social technologies to our advantage. And from my perspective, a useful alternative, well, a, a, an effective alternative is going to be useful, convenient, and resilient. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to think whether or not there should be something else embedded within that in order for it to move us forward. Because like you said, technology in and of itself isn't necessarily neutral. Mm -hmm. Is that making sense to you at all? Like, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're essentially asking, is there, is it, is that it, or is there more that we need out of tech? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the right question to ask, but ultimately I think, that, I think we do have to admit the tech cannot solve our, all of our problems by itself. And, you know, that's a big reason I'm going on this podcast. Cause if I thought that, you know, the world was just going to become more free and more wonderful to be in just because technology is advancing, then, you know, there would be kind of no point in talking about it. And, and also, too, I don't necessarily believe that technology is, you know, monotonically just going up all, everywhere. But yeah, so a good example, I think, or a good case study is Ethereum, which is um, a, a distributed ledger blockchain thing. It's a it's a distributed finance technology where essentially you can you can program financial contracts that two people or different parties can uh, sign on for, and then the system itself um, is spread out across all of its users. And so, if someone can provide a like, basically, you, you if you can set up a way for the system to detect that a contract has been fulfilled, then it executes the contract. It executes the the transaction automatically using what's called the zero knowledge proof. That means no human has to actually look at the data. The system can encrypt the data and operate on it and then send the money where it needs to go. Cutting out so much um, from an ideological standpoint, cutting out the ability to tax and the ability to control what financial arrangements people go into theoretically. And now that system, Ethereum, just got updated, I think, in the last year um, to actually, no, it got updated like a month ago um, to version two, which is really resilient. So they're really good at making it, from a game theory perspective, really hard to hack and really hard for people to cheat and get and steal money. But it's not yet convenient. That's a recognized problem with it. What was the other one? Convenient, resilient? Useful, convenient, and resilient. Useful, right. And also it's not proven useful yet. Um, that's the funny thing is that it's, it's on paper, such a good idea, but the people, the people who love the idea need to get out there and build stuff with it. And they also have to make those systems ergonomic so that, you know, everyday people can, can use them. It's all very new and very like, you know, unexplored. We, we have no idea what effect that's going to have. 
and it might end up looking like a Neil Stevenson book <laughs> and it might just flop. So what it takes ultimately is for people to think about how they want to arrange their lives and imagine new ways of connecting with other people. And that's something that technology can't do for us. Um, neither the market nor technology can, but, okay, so technology and, and markets can provide for our desires and satisfy our desires extremely well, but they cannot tell us what to desire. They're value neutral. That's right. Okay. Is a transhuman future inevitable? No. Uh, expand on that. Why, why, what makes you say no so quickly? Well, I mean, the world could vanish in a, you know, humanity could vanish in a pandemic or a nuclear holocaust or an AI uprising. Mm. Um, if we survive, though, all kinds of things could happen. It might be that we, so it might be that human society fails to sort of, it fails to grow economically. And we're sort of stuck in this, I don't know, this world that we're living in for another like couple hundred years until we run out of like the resources necessary to sort of keep the party going. And we never go mine asteroids or something. I don't really see that happening. But the other part of transhumanism is not just economic growth, but also morphological freedom, the ability of, for people to change themselves into something else and to augment their, their cognition and their bodily freedom. To the extent that that's like physically possible, I, I do wonder whether people will choose to do it, whether they'll choose to become something else in a way that's like, you know, beyond me using my computer as a second brain type of thing, me using my phone to call someone across the world. I don't know. In a sense, we've been living in a transhumanist world since we mm -hmm. invented medicine. Um, but in another sense, like when it comes to shedding the human form, I guess, if that's what you're talking about, then I don't think that that's inevitable. And uh, that's ultimately an engineering question and a cultural question as to whether people want that. Yeah, I sort of think that it would happen incrementally. I know that's not like profound to say, but mm. I think people just are comfortable with things when, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, what what's that big of a difference between like glasses and glasses that help you see at night? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Right. And the, and the cyberpunk future that is like imagined, I mean, I should I should mention that like Cyberpunk is more than Cyberpunk 20, 20, 2077 or whatever, the super like boring video game that everyone is really excited about, which, I don't know, from what I've seen, just like has so little imagination in it. <laughs> <laughs> but like in Cyberpunk, you see people, you know, a society that is extremely wealthy in some ways and, you know, incredibly poor in other ways, spiritually poor obviously. Like if you read William Gibson's Neuromancer, like you see just how derelict the human experience is, despite the fact that they have all these cool tech technologies. There's just like an emptiness everywhere. And tech is like sucking the life out of the human spirit. And the heroes like have to sort of just try to reclaim that in some, some small way. I think that that's like the thing that people have forgotten is that like cyberpunk was originally not in this glamorous thing. It was, it was a warning, right? Anyway, the, whole, the point of all this, <laughs> this is my, this is my process, right? I blabber on for a while and then I try to, I find a way to sum it up. <laughs> the, the, the summation of all this is just, is this, is that you can't just get rid of human nature. You must understand it. You must do the hard work of grappling with it. And that has to happen at a cultural level. So I think you're right that it will be gradual. The question is, you know, is our, what, what needs to happen for people to, I don't know, for people to grapple with those things, that ug feel, that refusal to look directly at something that needs to be talked about is a, is a normal part of humans, right? Going back to the internal family systems, we're really, really good at like ignoring things that make us uncomfortable and like forgetting things in our past that made us uncomfortable. And so I think that culture and language ultimately have to lead the way to addressing those things. And there's no text shortcut around that. Mm -hmm. So how do we how do we have a techno future that's not utterly spiritually void or utterly dystopian mm -hmm. like the cyberpunk futures you're referring to? 
paradoxically, part of me thinks that it has to, you have to get off the internet somehow. <laughs> like uh, this conversation would be going differently if you and I were physically present, right? Mm -hmm. If you were sitting across the table from me, we could share a beer, we could share a hug, we could share the same air, right? And mm -hmm. COVID obviously has shown that our social connections are weak over the internet when we're all sequestered away into our own homes. You know, if you're living, if you're living through COVID and self-isolating, then the person, the people, and just the beings that you're with physically are the most important people in your life. So I think maybe I'm projecting there. Who knows? <laughs> well, they become that way anyways. They become mm -hmm. your your savior and your enemy and mm -hmm. everything in between. Exactly. Because yeah. That's the only person you see or people you see on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and maybe, you know, for what it's worth, maybe we're, we are both married. And so maybe this is just a, how marriage is. Uh, I've seen people talk about marriage that way, where it's just, you know, the other person, you see the best and the worst of them, and they are the one who has to put up with all of your shit. Yeah. But but yeah, the, the, the point is, I guess, that alienation is occurring. Uh, and depression is, is, you know, spreading faster than COVID, <laughs> I guess. And at the end of the day, like, I think for any tech, any technological, any like social connection you want to make with technology, it has to be, I think it should be underwritten by like some, some deeper, more like physical connection with other people. And I'll, I'll give you some, I'll give you actually an example that might be interesting there's a, the Neil Stevenson book, The Diamond Age, uh, is a really good and like thought provoking book. It's kind of a weird topia, like I talked about before, where it's not, it's not, it's dystopia maybe for some people. Um, it's utopia for some other people. It's not like, a, it's not clearly one way or the other. And in the society, essentially, nanotechnology has allowed people to set up like micro states, like sort of anywhere, um, as long as they have like a nanotech cloud that sort of covers that geographical area. And that like nanotech advancements have basically meant the evaporation of, of large nation states. And instead you have people joining into political groups, um, political um, alliances that span the whole world. So it's like a club that has like chapters in you know, the US in Shanghai, in Germany or where, wherever, right? And you can fly in a plane like to get to like that chapter of your club, essentially. And that's your political entity that you're part of. In that world, they still have to grapple with the fact that those groups are larger than, um, you know, they're you can't know everyone in that group. And so to build like in-group togetherness every year or so, you as a member of that club have to go out and do something that is suicidal and the like, like fall, like tying yourself to a rope and then falling off a cliff. And the only, you have no way of knowing whether that suicidal act is actually going to kill you or whether someone else in your political group has like tied the rope to something so that you're saved or like not loaded the gun, right? Taking the bullets out of the gun. And you have to trust that the other people in your political group are, it's called your clave. Uh, the other people in that group like have your back. And so putting your life in the hands of a stranger every year is the price of that togetherness, which again, which then makes you think about what are the, what are the costs of current nation states? Like what is, what are the costs of our supposed togetherness? Maybe it's more, maybe it's less than something like that. But I guess what I'm saying is that like people over the internet do have trust issues and there's manifestly a chilling effect present now where, you know, you can't say too much um, in public. So I, I, anyway, I think it's essentially that the future of technology in the social realm is going to be more closed. It's going to be more about committing to strong alliances with other people who might be strangers and having some and tech allowing you to prove that in some sense. So this has all been very interesting so far, I think anyways. We've explored a lot of your thoughts obviously, but to the extent that you're comfortable with it, how have your personal beliefs or convictions changed since you first embraced radical politics? 
Yeah. So I'm trying to think back when I, when I first got exposed to this stuff, I think my, my sort of political awakening was watching Robert Higgs speak. He's an American economist who has since retired and, and moved to uh, Mexico uh, to live happily ever after um, with his family. And uh, he's, he's a really cool guy. I think he's more of an economic historian now that I think about it. Um, but essentially, he has written some very well-respected work on the growth of government. And essentially, his, his speech was, it wasn't really a call to action in any way, because he's not that kind of a person. But it was just a lament um, about not just the, the growth of government as such, but just sort of the, the personal effects that the, the personal consequences of the modern world. He lamented the, the millions of people who are languishing in prison for nonviolent offenses or people who are, are not a threat to society. You have laments about the regulation of people's bodies with regards to sex work, laments about the people killed in wars, wars that did not need to happen, the control of speech, uh, the control of the restriction of uh, trade between peaceful people who want to you know, do what they are good at and exchange the products of their labor for both people's betterment, a lament for the inability of people to, to just move to a new place where their skills are more suited. Uh, they're more economically beneficial to other people and they can make a better life for themselves. And all of these laments, like, were just, it was so poetic and I was so moved by it. I actually was moved to tears. And I think I, I hold, I still hold on to all of that feeling. And I think what has changed is, I guess, my sense of orientation in the world, or I guess my, my place in that struggle. My view of human nature has changed, um, obviously, since we've been talking a whole lot about the self. And also, like, I have changed my view on why I was in it in the first place. And it's kind of like led me to reflect on what is the role of anarchism in making the world a better place? I think that's the basic idea. Previously, like we would talk about changing the world. We were a bunch of moral philosophy nerds, essentially. Just philosophy nerds in general. People who read a lot of books and like to argue, talk about ideas, talk about historical events, and like think about the future, right? I think what changed for me was just recognizing that one, a certain kind of person becomes really political act, politically active in this way. I mean, I was a college student and I was motivated to host events where we could spread ideas, where we could talk about the ideas that could, you know, solve problems in a more peaceful way, things like that. And ultimately, like, I saw some fruit from that, some, some people changing their minds. And, you know, I'm sure that the few hundred people who came to those events um, were changed in some way. But I also had to grapple with the fact that most people are not susceptible to these kinds of messages. Most people don't care about freedom in this way. And also they're not altruistic because they don't have the luxury of being altruistic. I think that religion actually can kind of get you that in some sense. And in a way, what we were doing was religious. But at the end of the day, if people don't buy into your ideas then you have to ask yourself why. why. Why is our message not getting out, getting through? Why is it not striking a chord? And what do I need to change about my message to make the world a better place in this specific way? So you're not going to abolish nihilism or oppression or, uh, or cruelty or indifference because that kind of thing can't be abolished. There's no, there's no law to be repealed. These are facts of the human experience or they can't be abolished in the same way that you could destroy an object right they can't they cannot be abolished in that way mm -hmm. and that language you know that language comes from people who are crying out against systems that were in place things that you could point to and say ah like like abolish that law or ab abolish that practice um but even abolishing that practice right like it's also a distributed system and it's resilient in that way. Culture is a distributed system. And if the culture of China is that most people don't want democracy and they, do, they certainly don't want what we're selling, <laughs> then what are you going to do? So where I went from that is essentially that 
have to work within the confines of what's possible um, in your personal life. And I decided for myself that I needed to talk a lot less and to try to gain competency in something that, um, that, that could ultimately um, make the world a better place. I mean, for me, freedom, freedom is, is a core good. It is something that allows scientific advancement is something that allows people to make choices of their own and to take responsibility for their actions and to take pride in what they've done rather than, you know, doing what someone else tells them to do and just being a tool um, or treated as a tool. And that is a core good, but it's not the, it's not the only thing that's good. It kind of in the same way as technology and markets can give you options, right? Optionality is not the only good. It can be the thing that you, you know, you strive to maximize in some sense, right? Like if I wanted to sum up my political project in like one sentence, it would look something like I want intelligent agents to proliferate throughout the galaxy, being able to make more and weightier choices forever until the end of time. All that is to say that like, that's a very lofty goal and, and it's so far divorced from what I can accomplish in my lifetime. I just, it's a, it's almost science fiction. It's almost religion. You know, it has that flair. And ultimately, like I said, we have much more power over what we desire, like what we want to want. I think that that's a recent revelation for me is that people can still like where, where human agency is in the 21st century is in choosing what you want to want and choosing what you want to be and becoming more aware of the pressures on you to do some particular thing and, and letting, letting go, I suppose, of things that you thought were you in order to achieve something that is more pure, that is more you. And this is kind of like going back to the, to the talk about self I think that like the human subject, like, okay, if you sit by yourself and think about your feelings, if you just experience feelings, you can step back from the feelings and get between, like get mentally between the stimulus of your mind and of your body and what you choose to do. Like you can be in that space. And that very fact proves that you are not, you just your mind you're almost something inside of your mind and the things that you think are you um, are often things that other people have sold you on that has sort of taken up residence. And you know, this all sounds super, I mean, I feel like I should put a trigger warning on this because it sounds very schizophrenic. Humans are the most complex thing in my world. And uh, I guess that's my message. That's, that's all there is, is that, human choice never exits the equation. And if it does, then all is lost. We can't put our faith in, in tech or in like sacred cows of our subculture or of in orthodox beliefs. You can't put your faith in, you should, I don't think that you should put your faith in things. Well, what should you put your faith in? It's a good question. Should you put your faith in anything? <laughs> that's, that's ultimately what I was, that's like what I was about to say, but you know, that's so dark. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, why would faith be necessary? Faith is usually uh, a mask for something you don't want to look at. Right. If you could change anything within the scene that you and I have been in, what would it be? Well, I mean, if I could change every, anything, I would just make them all super geniuses. Everyone who politically agrees with me, make them all super geniuses. <laughs> yep. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, what would I change? I mean, I don't know if I have a plan. I don't, I don't think people should listen to me and think that I have the answers. I sort of, all I really have is a, a limited set of observations and just talking about what I see. Because of course, like my experience in the scene is very, is very limited and it's, you know, of course biased. But I think, I think what I wish is, I wish that people would be more conscious of their role in a larger historical project and less less self-serving and more reflective i guess is like the very big picture so here so i can kind of like flesh that out a little bit there are lots of different kinds of people um, who come to anarchism 
they come to it for different reasons and from different backgrounds. And my kind of like internal taxonomy is you have you have your your William Godwins, your Kropotkins, um, your Proudhons, who sort of are more in it more for the philosophy, um, and they're they're interested in the ideas and they really believe in them, but they are they're coming at it from more of an academic angle. Um, and then you have people who are like the Emma Goldmans, the Volture and Declares, the whoever else you've had on your podcast, <laughs> right? Those people who have suffered under the various systems that are being critiqued. I mean, I think that, I think we all have some kind of suffering that we're drawing on, but there are people who, who are in the movement to actually change things, right? They're, and they are doing that and they would die unfulfilled if they were not out in the, out in the streets, changing people's minds and changing people's lives, right? People who, the kinds of people who do food, not bombs, who send letters to prisoners, who help immigrants with legal work, that kind of work, right? Um, trying to get people out of war zones. That kind of work is, is born from a kind of passion that I simply don't relate to, but I, I respect it. I respect the hell out of it. Ultimately, I think the movement needs both of those kinds of people if it's to amount to anything. But you also have a third group who is kind of just like, they're in it for the social benefits without actually like really believing it. And it's sort of like a phase of life for them. <laughs> but those people do exist. And like, all it takes is one person to throw a bomb for like eight people to become haymarket martyrs, right? Ultimately, I don't think anyone knows who threw the bomb back in like a hundred years ago. No one knows for sure. But it just takes like one person to kind of screw the whole thing up. I think this is particularly relevant today because we are living in a very polarized age where there's just a chasm in our in our society, and that's harmful. And what I ultimately want to say is just repeating something Emmy said on episode, which is, you know, you do not want civil war. Mm -hmm. You don't want that. You don't want civil conflict, not just because you can't win, but because it is just it is going against everything you believe in. That's my my real belief. I think that people who are trying to antagonize the right are shooting themselves and everyone else in the foot and just being deeply irresponsible. I think that when, what I would like to see anarchists doing is doing what the establishment left cannot do, which is trying to treat people as human beings, which is the core of our beliefs, and trying to meet them where they are at and, you know, doing, doing what you can. I'm not saying that like, you know, this, this isn't what I'm saying isn't like, Oh, can't we all be friends and like, can't trans people be friends with people who literally want to kill them. The point is more that those extremists who actually just want to fuck shit up are the, the minority within their respective movements, both in Antifa and on the right. They're smaller groups than everyone thinks. The potential for terrible violence is always there in everybody, but I don't think, I think what's essentially going on is that each side of the left-right divide has decided to enter a game-theoretic death spiral where they own their opponent's fear because they hate them so much, and they agree to become more like what their opponent fears and escalating the conflict um, in this mimetic way. There are people who think that, you know, that the meme level of society like has no consequences and it does, and they're playing a very dangerous game. So that's, that's pretty much what I would change ultimately is, is I would say that people who are free to reach out to people who have very different political beliefs should exercise that freedom and they should, they should take some risk to reach out and make the world a more peaceful place. By the time this comes out, it would have probably been about a month, I guess, since uh, Trump has not been president. What are some things that happened over the last four years under a Trump presidency that you least expected? That I least expected? Hmm. Well, the easy ones, I guess I'll start with. I didn't expect Trump to push for transparency in hospital billing. <laughs> I didn't expect him to condemn the Chinese government putting the Uyghur Muslims into concentration camps. Although, of course, that's probably a self-serving, just opportunist attack on the Chinese government. It's still nice to see some attention on that because 
there are millions of Muslims in concentration camps right now or otherwise under Chinese total control. But what am I actually surprised by? I guess I just expected he would get some get more things done, maybe. But even that was just more of a paranoia. Because I remember when he was actually inaugurated, there were so many pictures coming out of that where he just looks dejected. At the moment that the election was called, you can see a picture of him just like leaning on his hand. Everyone around him is cheering and he is just like in the pits because it was <laughs> it was like not meant to go this far. <laughs> I, I think that I think that like mostly he didn't actually want to be president. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think I, anything really surprised me too much. I mean, what we what we got was um was a schlub who's really, really good at talking and really good at like whipping people up into fear and paranoia, sort of like, you know, grabbing these American pathologies and bundling them all together. But there was no end game, I think, for him besides, you know, trying to make some money and sort of like, you know, build up his popularity. I, I think that's probably what he was going for. So the fact that we're, you know, we're maybe looking at a fizzling of that movement. People, his, people in his base um, are approving of him so lowly and like they were they're disapproving of him and, you know, saying he was a disappointment. And I sort of wonder if the, you know, if the Q and non-believers are the only ones left, the only true believers left. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. I agree that he was bigly good at talking. <laughs> the best. Yes. Tremendous, beautiful, big, beautiful words. <laughs> uh, so you ended up actually voting this last election. Why was that? Mm -hmm. Well, I thought voting for Trump would be hilarious. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I voted for Biden, obviously. And uh, I just think it seemed like it could make a difference in North Carolina. I believe the election was pretty close here. And I am not a big supporter of Joe Biden at all, of course. Like, you know, I, I think he's probably going to be better than Trump, at least like for anything to change, for any single thing to get better besides like the one or two things that Trump did really well, like the hospital billing, I guess. it's It just seemed to me that he had to go like just nothing was going to get better while everybody is like, while the country, half the country can't talk to the other kind of like half of the country. And they are just every day, like aggravated by this fool. So I don't know. I, I mean, to be honest, I'm just sick of it. And I figured it could make a small difference. Ultimately, like in most cases, your vote probably doesn't matter in Texas. My vote would not have mattered, mm -hmm. but in North Carolina, um, I think maybe it did. Who knows? Yeah. So switching gears, to what extent can we blame your religious upbringing for all the wonderful things about you? <laughs> I guess it depends on what you think is wonderful about me. Could you name something? I can't think of a single thing off the top of my head. No. <laughs> you know what I mean. The, the, uh, we, we've talked about it before, but the decent things that have been embedded within you, the reason you might be kind to a stranger or generous to someone or whatever mm. you know should we point the finger at our religious upbringing that we now <laughs> both oppose yeah right uh for sure i think that there's a lot there so the thing about my religious upbringing in a nutshell is that i sort of was in two religious traditions at the same time one of which was like your normal bible believing not normal your your extreme extremely bible believing protestant christianity which basically just takes the Bible as the sole source of truth. And then there's also like a classical Christian upbringing that I was in where you are trained to, you're, you're, you know, you're brought up in, in literature and history and philosophy, and you're trained to view the world as an expression of God's will and to sort of interpret things in that way. So those two things are in conflict and sort of that's, that conflict is what made me, I think, um, what I am. So I guess where I would take that is on the classical side, I was, I was raised to believe deeply in the true, the good, and the beautiful, to see those things as objective realities, as part of the fabric of God's creation. And we would sit around round table discussions and like talk about books and talk about history and 
philosophy all in the same class. Like there was one class for all of that. And so that gave me a leg up in understanding the world that I live in to some extent. But I think that there's also a price to be paid because everything is trade-offs. If you view the world as an expression of God's will, you're likely to have sort of a stunted theory of mind, I think. Like if you're looking for the seeds of God's movement in other people or like the fruit of the spirit, right? Then you disattribute that those things from the human being itself, <laughs> right? And you, you're you less motivated to actually think about people's motivations outside of this systematic framework. So you have to sort of relearn that and discover it for your own. But what it, what it does do is it gives you, it does give you interpretive lenses on larger phenomena, I suppose. And it gives you a desire for um, some kind of truth. I don't know if it's the truth, but it's some kind of truth. And it makes you want to see connections between everything. And that's definitely the way that I am. I believe in the true, the good, and the beautiful still in a very specific way. (laughs) And I think that I'm still serving that religion in a sense. But Maybe it's maybe the fact is that growing up on a fault line, a philosophical fault line is really where the magic is. When I think about the people that I really respect, they also grew up sort of in a, a conflict of thought, right? Where their life was, their life kind of kept them thinking about things or questioning their current situation. That has trade offs too. But, you know, I think the answer is yeah, that it definitely made me what I am. And religion. Religion can certainly have benefits, yeah. The true, the good, and the beautiful, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Why are those three things still meaningful for you? I guess it's the only thing that's sort of unassailable to me, or the only thing that's worth defending, I guess. (laughs) How have your, your conceptions of those things changed from when you were religious to Mm -hmm. where you are now? Not too much, maybe. It's almost like... It's almost like a mask has been taken off. I remember when I sort of accepted that I I couldn't... Well, there, So there was a long period of time where I struggled with trying to stay Christian, basically. I was looking through all the different kinds of Christianity because I sort of had exited non-denominational Christianity, which just ultimately doesn't have a long tradition and it had internal consistencies because it's trying to do too much. If you're this particular kind of Bible-believing Christian. So I sort of moved on from that and was like trying to find some other Christianity that reflected what I saw, which was like ultimately like admitting of imperfection in the church on one level and also solving the problem of evil (laughs) is kind of what I wanted. And when I gave up the ghost, I basically said, okay, I got to admit that I can't make this work. I can't become orthodox and like use you know, like build up my own conception inside of Orthodox Christianity. Like I realized I was forcing it, right? And I had to let go. And I guess what came out of that was one, like an immense freedom that like, I was no longer bound by God's plan. (laughs) Like it was no longer there. And suddenly like my choices mattered more. Mm. And also to the, like my, the excuses that I was making from that perspective about, you know, not doing certain things in my life also had to be reckoned with. What remained, what, you know, I didn't feel any need to get rid of or like reckon with was goodness, truth, and beauty. Like the virtue ethical like framework that I sort of emerged into all was able to explain those things in terms of intersubjective realities. Like there is, there is a, an action that is right for me. That is abs- that is objectively right. And it is right in that it it makes me a better person according to these certain virtues, right? And what is right for me may not be the right action if you did it, because you have a different teleology, you're a different person. And it, it was still clear to me that there are so many ways that you can go wrong in life and so few ways that you can be right. And being right is like hitting the target. That's actually what sin means in the original biblical language is uh, missing the mark. And so it's like, you know, you can have the whole, the whole world except for that point is the, is the wrong thing to do. And there are just different like degrees of wrong. And I still think that, I still kind of think in that way that 
goodness is something that emerges from reality. It is something that is real and is like it partakes of something that is foundational to the, the universe we live in. It's as emergent as as a language, as mathematics, as you know, what we know as physics from whatever underpins physics. That's my belief. And beauty, you know, beauty and truth are similar in that way. Of course, talking about truth is really tricky and it's a whole nother situation. It's, it's sort of like a whole nother discussion, but that's my basic answer to that question. Yeah. Well, that's all just a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I just feel like being blasphemous for some reason. Um, well, you can blaspheme against, <laughs> against my stuff and that's fine. I actually really like reading blasphemy. <laughs> it's got its place. Mm-hmm. Okay, so towards the end of these interviews, I like to do a lightning round where I list a series of people or ideas and have my guests respond to each item in one minute or less. Are you down? Mm -hmm, I'm game. Ray Kurzweil. Don't know hardly anything about him. I haven't read anything he's written. I just know that he was promising a singularity where AI just becomes this benevolent god. And uh, I'm pretty sure that's what he promised. And, you know, everything would just take off from there and we would be heaven forever. I think that's oversimplified. I think that's, you know, I'm sure the man's a genius, but I'm not sure if he's relevant today. All right. Washington, D.C. Never really liked it. But to be fair, I mean, I've visited there four or five times. And every time I go, I spend most of my time at a conference. So my exposure to the environment of D.C. has been just trying to get from place to place through the biting cold and not being able to take a piss anywhere because <laughs> there's just nowhere to take a piss. So yeah, not a big fan of DC personally. Abolish public urination laws. Yes. I right. wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> if nobody, if nobody owns it, you can piss on it. <laughs> well, you can do anything if you're brave enough, Cooper, but that's, uh, <laughs> thank you for holding me accountable. <laughs> um hannah arndt okay she's great i first read her book the promise of politics and i loved it she's a really dense writer um but i think her basic idea about politics being our ability to live with each other and the fact and the complexity that she admits of and the way she situa situates it in historical development, especially alongside technology. It's all really good. It's, it's amazing stuff. The Life of the Mind is also a great book. Yeah, love Hannah Arendt. John Calvin. John Calvin. God, um, a guy who fomented civil war uh, over religion. Yeah, super interesting guy. Probably, probably responsible for more psychological suffering than most people I can think of. I mean, like tulip Calvinism is a mind virus. It is a, it is a, a torture device and I wouldn't wish it upon anybody. Wow. What is tulip Calvinism? It's, it's a set of five doctrines um, that underpin Calvinism. And uh, the basic idea is that everyone deserves to go to hell and you'll go to hell if it's predestined that you will, and you can't do anything about it. And the same goes for if you're going to heaven. I can't stand that. All right. <laughs> Mammoth Grinder. Great band. Yeah. Um, I, I like their first album the best. I, I think that that was, they all kind of went downhill from there, but it's still good. It's still good music. And you and I went to a great Mammoth Grinder show and, uh, and got into some good hijinks. I, I, I love that band. Deep Fakes. Huh. They're probably, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's interesting that a lot of people were afraid of deep fakes and like that thought that they would, you know, everyone would be making porn of everybody and people would be inventing political scenarios. I think that's going to happen in certain instances and it'll be really high profile, but I don't think, but it's still really good and people aren't using it that way. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see what happens when it becomes really easy to make a deep fake. Mm -hmm. No idea. All right. So I have more listener questions than normal. Hmm. So I'll ask you these and then we can we can move on. Okay. The first is what men's grooming products do you use for your beard and long hair? Uh, so I use moisturizing shampoo and conditioner, not only for my beard, but also for my hair. And then I, when it's wet, I, I sort of dry it off until, until it's damp. And then I use um, a beard... Uh, a beard balm from Honest Amish. 
And sometimes if I have like a, if I do have a handlebar mustache, which I rarely do, um, I use this wax called Ungurich Bar Twitch, some, some Hungarian or something, probably not Hungarian. It's, I don't even know what language that is. <laughs> it's not Hungarian, but uh, yeah, that's, that's what I do. All right. Is localism always a form of micronationalism? Ooh, spicy. That's a question. I was curious about this thinking about Syrian um, rebels, how they're, you know, trying to build democratic confederalism in Kurdistan, actually, which is inhabits three countries. And I don't I don't think it has to be nationalism. I think you can have a community. Everyone has their own community they care about more than other people. And I think that also, too, you can be part of a political community that is um, has a good relation to other communities, to other other polities. So yeah, I don't think it has to be micronationalism. You just have to have good principles, right? You just have to build your society on peaceful principles and also something that is sustainable in the long run, geopolitically. All right. You've read Banks' Culture Series, Robinson's Mars Trilogy, and Le Guin's The Dispossessed. Do any of those come close to depicting an anarchist ethos you feel aligned with? And are these sorts of sci-fi depictions of anarchist societies valuable for radicals to be familiar with? Dude, I, I love all those books, of course. I don't want to live on Anaris, that's for sure, <laughs> which is in Le Guin's book. But I, I think that The Dispossessed, for one, is a, is a great book just viewed through like a sort of a spiritual lens, like thinking about how you form your identity and how you pursue your life goals um, is just incredible for anarchists to read because like it cuts at that, like that, what am I actually, what do I actually want to do with my life? And what is, what am I treating as a religion? Right. And the culture series, I think is a great meditation on cruelty and um, cruelty and kindness or cruelty and compassion, I guess. And what is the ultimate goal of all of this? I don't know that it has really good political value um, outside of just entertaining people who dream of the best world possible. Um, <laughs> uh, but the Mars trilogy is like really, I think it's really, I don't know. What's funny about that is that it's really scientific and kind of like hard, hard headed like that. But ultimately it dreams of a world, like a world that is full of really smart people. Mars is like, you know, inhabited by scientists who I live a very philosophical society. And uh, I, I ultimately, I think it's a little bit too optimistic because so many of their problems are just resolved by talking it out. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it is a, you know, an intensely real, you know, real politic pragmatist book, but I still think it's not realistic enough. And it's, and I, maybe no writer can reach the level of complexity that I expect from that kind of um, simulated reality, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it, yeah, it's great. Mars trilogy and the dispossessed, you know, we should all read. All right. How concerned are you about privacy protections and big tech? Yeah. I mean, I passed the point of concern. I think, <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I think people should sort of expect that the world will keep getting more panoptic. Mm. And if you don't want it to be that way, then find people who, you know, Basically, learn learn to use your computer. Mm. What kinds of things do you think film is better at expressing than other art mediums, and why? Mm. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think the thing that it's really good at is bringing you into someone else's world, and I I feel like that doesn't really describe it. So, like a good example is David Lynch. He seems to live in this world where people are really, really different from each other. Like you think you know somebody and they do something really strange that it just can't be explained. And you can find paranoia in that or you can find the humor in it. And that's something I love about David Lynch. Like if you watch Twin Peaks, there's all these kooky characters who are anything but like normal. And you just, I don't think you could really get that. I mean, you can get that in some music, but in a very limited way. In books, you kind of can, but like there's so much about timing right like there's a vibe going on in film there's a like if you're, if you're in the same place as someone and the vibe is off then film is much better at conveying that than books i think mm. so it's it's a vibe thing it's about like what emotions you want to evoke in someone and what how can you surprise them 
ultimately though, like the film medium is cheapened by like the casual way in which we watch films. I think that like the loss of movie theaters is pretty sad because in a movie theater, you can barely escape like what's happening on screen. You can't really like look somewhere else and like get more, get different stimuli. Um, so, so being like kind of having this experience impressed upon you is what is what film is really good at. All right. Do you have any advice for people who are interested in making the world a better place? I mean, question everything, including yourself, be more embodied and, and don't be just in your head and relationships are everything. So just make your relationships really good. And if, if you want to make the world a better place, then that's basically the place you have to start. All right, Cooper. Well, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a long time coming. I've been wanting to have you on for some time and I'm flattered that you joined me for this and I, I've really enjoyed it. So thank you. Yeah, totally. I, and I'm flattered to be on. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Awesome, man. Well, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Take it easy. There it is, folks. I hope everyone enjoyed this installment of the show. If you liked this episode, be sure to check out our full catalog at nonserviummedia.com or at youtube.com slash nonserviummedia. And make sure to subscribe to receive notifications each time we release a new episode. If you're interested in seeing this project continue, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. And if you can't contribute financially, you can help us out simply by liking and sharing this episode. As usual, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project going. Finally, be sure to keep an eye out for the next episode. Thank you all so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon.